Um, thank you very much for being here today and for dragging yourselves away from the television screens for a moment. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen while we're actually in this lecture theatre, but uh, I realise it's uh, an interesting time, if not a pivotal time for Australian politics, uh, so I am deeply grateful. Um, some of you might be surprised that the World Bank Group would be um, really in campaign mode around climate change. I hope that in the course of the next few minutes I can persuade you why that is. In some respects, talking about climate change in Australia is very difficult. It's a bit like taking coals to Newcastle. You, better than anybody else, understand what's happening here and now, not just to somebody else in the future. Um, as your climate commission has noted, in the period of just 90 days in this country, you recorded the hottest summer ever, the hottest day, and the hottest seven consecutive days. Many of you have experienced floods or extreme heat yourself, and you've all seen the pictures of tragedy and suffering. The bushfires were among the, among the most devastating effects of the unprecedented heat waves in the east and southeast of Australia this year, but floods and torrential rains in other parts of the country have also um, added to the loss of life and the destruction. So, um, I think it's very important that the rest of the world listen to your climate commission when your climate commission says that climate change was a major driving force behind the string of extreme weather events. Scientists have been reluctant to make the link between extreme weather events and climate volatility, and so it is an important uh, announcement that the Commission recently made. Now, our mission hasn't changed. Now, our mission for more than 60 years has been to try to end poverty. Now we talk about ending poverty and building some kind of shared prosperity in a world which has become more equal, but within countries inequality has, has grown. Um, and I think that the concept of shared equality is not just dealing with shared prosperity, is not about just dealing with inequality today. It's about dealing with issues of equity and equality for future generations. And so we have to build a prosperity which is uh, more evenly distributed today, but a prosperity that stands a chance of being able to build prosperity for future generations, at which point being able to account for and being able to value the uh, environmental base upon which all of our wealth is uh, being created is very important. And if one is creating a prosperity today, which is simply going to narrow down the options and choices of future generations, that is not truly shared. So uh, we are trying to help countries uh, work through their poverty eradication strategies and we're trying to help countries build growth that will build that kind of shared prosperity. This is not going to be achieved overnight, and it requires a long-term understanding of trade-offs, what needs to be done and how best to do it. So one of the challenges we've been facing was to try to get a, an understanding of what a warmer planet means for the world. Imagine that we have to be able to respond to questions from our clients, developing countries in the world, from fragile and conflict-affected states to low-income countries to middle-income countries, asking us the question of how we can help them adapt to the climate change that they're seeing now in their farming communities, in their cities, their coastal cities, in their imagined urban development. How do they adapt to, prepare for, invest in resilience? And we found ourselves you know, at a loss for how to respond because we couldn't answer the question, to what should they adapt? And what we found through the work that we've done in the Four Degree Report is that, in fact, if we're imagining a two-degree world, a three-degree world, a four-degree world, perhaps a five- or six-degree world, because that four-degree is a global average. So in the inner continent of Africa, it's going to be more like six. In some of the islands of Indonesia, it's going to be something like six as well. That If, that's, if you're asking people to adapt to a four-degree world, it's a very different proposition than a two-degree world. At a two-degree world, yes, we're talking about maybe moving coffee 500 metres further up the mountainside. At four degrees, we might be talking about actually forgetting about coffee. And so how do you respond to clients' questions about how to adapt? That was one of the motivations before, behind taking on this report. So we commissioned, so we're a data-driven, evidence-based, you know, economic uh, institution, a bank, and we commissioned a scientific report, turned down the heat, which spelled out the consequences of a four degree centigrade warmer world. The important thing to note is that scientists agree that even countries' current emission pledges made under the United Nations Framework uh, Convention 
will likely result in a three to four degree world, world by 2100. That's really important because in Copenhagen in 2009, the agreement was that we would cap emissions in order to achieve a two degree world. Uh, now that two degree world was somewhat arbitrary, but it seemed like a reasonable number. We're already at 0.8 degrees. What we now know since 2009 is that even at 0.8 degrees, we're starting to see devastation in biodiversity loss, in coral reef uh, health, that we thought we'd only see at one and a half and two degrees. So we already know that that two degree, even if we met the two degree target, we're not, we're not sort of get out of jail free, right? There's still gonna be consequences of two degree. But at four degree, we really do um, have some serious uh, impacts to, to wrestle with. But those pledges today have not been met. So even if they were met, we're headed for three to four degrees, they haven't yet been met. Uh, and the longer that they remain unmet, the more likely it is that we will end up at four degrees. What did we find in the report? Well, that climate change would cause seas to rise between a half and one meter. Um, now that dramatically affects the lives of the urban population in the coastal cities of this world. And remember the rate at which we are urbanizing and imagine that most of that urbanization is happening in Africa and Asia, and a lot of it is concentrated on coastal cities. So we're going to have more and more and more people, including more and more poor people living in informal settlements in coastal cities with sea about to rise. Large sections of the world will become much, much hotter, providing huge challenges for growing crops. The report calculates that 35% of the cropland of sub-Saharan Africa will be taken out of production. Now, at the moment, in the food security debate, we're talking about taking the cropland of sub-Saharan Africa and increasing its productivity because it's one of the areas of cropland that is the furthest away from its yield, from the, from the maximum yield curve. Well, imagine if that is supposed to be one of the solutions to global food security at the moment. Remember, we have 850 million people who go to bed hungry every day today. That solution is now taken out of commission, as it were. That's not going to be part of the solution in a four-degree world. And uh, we see extreme weather events that were once seen as once in a lifetime happening every year. Uh, the, co the loss and damage associated with that is enormous. In the last 30 years, we've uh, we spent $30 trillion on disaster relief. That's a third of all overseas development assistance in the same period. So for those of you who've been contributing to um, ODA through your taxes, we've taken one of every $3 you've given and we've thrown it away. Uh, in order to meet relief, and now we're going to have to have humanitarian relief for an increased intensity and an increased, uh, an increased frequency uh, of natural disasters. So this is adding up. You can imagine it's one of those clocks that you get on buildings that's just running the tally of what this is going to cost. The loss and damage is just going to go up and up and up. And by 2025, 2.4 billion people are going to be estimated to live in countries where there is not enough water to meet their needs. Tomorrow is World Water Day. This is um, a fact that should uh, concentrate our minds. For Australia, well, increasingly arid. Some of the most extreme droughts are predicted for southern Australia. Extreme temperatures in summer will get worse. The January temperatures are 40 degrees centigrade or above, or about five degrees centigrade warmer than present day January days, your average January day, are gonna be very commonplace. You know, this is gonna be a shared experience for southern Australians with uh, the cities of the Middle East where you're starting to see city temperatures in the hotter months of the year uh, across the Middle East hitting 50, 51, 52, not just for one day, but for six, seven days at a time. Imagine living in cities if you are poor and young, which is the demography of that part of the world, in cities which are 55, 56, 57 degrees. Uh, these become ovens. We are going to have to build fridges to live inside ovens uh, in, in economies which are not robust at the moment. Um, it's going to get much more difficult to grow food here as well as everywhere else. Heat and drought stress are likely to increase mortality and species extinction. And as you know, temperature extremes are already held responsible for the mortality of the Australian flying fox species. Well, this, this kind of uh, understanding is just going to grow. But uh, your future, uh, our future, Australia's future, depends not only on what happens here, but uh, is deeply interlinked with the fate uh, of the region. The Pacific Islands will see unprecedented extreme temperatures, uh, becoming the new norm every month of the year. The sea level rise in the western Pacific 
will be even larger than the global mean, which I mentioned earlier. And together with stronger tropical cyclone storm surges and groundwater extraction, this is going to lead to an increasing risk of contaminated freshwater sources. Um, so Pacific islands already under deep stress are going to find even greater real freshwater shortages. Um, in February, uh, Pakistan and the United Kingdom called a special session of the UN Security Council to talk about climate change. This is the third time in the, in the Security Council's history that they have discussed climate change. Um, uh, Bob Carr and uh, uh, President Tong of Kiribati joined by video um, from, uh, from Kiribati. But Minister Tony de Brun uh, from the Marshall Islands was there too. And he kind of stopped the debate because he told the story of having gone to the uh, United Nations 35 years ago with a delegation from the Marshall Islands um, to petition the Security Council for its support for the Marshall Islands appeal to the Trusteeship Council for independence. Never in his life did he imagine that 35 years later he would have to go back to the UN, to the Security Council, this time not asking for independence but asking for survival to be told that the Security Council is not a venue that will consider such matters. And so the mainstreaming of climate change and security debate still has a long way to go. And just as he sort of stopped the debate at, by, by making this comment, he pointed to the uh, permanent representative of the Marshall Islands to the UN sitting in the first row and pointed out that her atoll had disappeared in the last two years, only visible now if you fly over at low altitude. So if the existence of entire nations is placed at risk, there could be serious implications for peace and security. The increase of migration and conflicts over increasingly scarce natural resources is something we're all be already beginning to see. So it's, the, the report paints a picture of a world that we really don't want to live in. We certainly don't want our children to live in it. From a development perspective, it is threatening not only to slow the advancement that we've seen over the last few decades, in, in, in poverty eradication, it's threatening to actually roll back progress. The president of the World Bank Group, uh, Jim Kim, um, tries to get people's attention um, by, by asking uh, the following question, which is, in 40 years' time, and your children or your grandchildren, or your great-grandchildren, depending on where you are in an age bracket, come to you and ask you the following question, how are you going to respond? <coughs> Now, he asks this question of leaders at the G20. He asks this question of leaders at the G8 or the World Economic Forum. And the question is, what did you do when you knew? And I think that's the question I'd like each of you to think about as you leave this theatre today. What did you do when you knew? So, for that reason, Jim Kim has put uh, climate change at the very top of the World Bank Group's agenda. We can't achieve our aspirations, our hopes, our mission for poverty eradication and building the shared prosperity if we don't focus on climate change. Climate change is the rug that is being pulled out from underneath the poor today and will be pulled out from underneath all of us, middle class, rich, wherever we live in the world, over the next 10 to 20 years if we don't start acting now. Now, of course, our core work is to build resilience, build resilience of the poor now, and we're going to continue to do that, but we're probably going to have to do more as well. We've stopped asking ourselves the question of what more should we do, what less should we do, what should we do differently, and have asked ourselves a different question. What are the least number of most important things that need to be done? And can we as the World Bank Group act as a catalyst or be part of a partnership or be part of the solution if we focus so clearly? And we have to do that because we could be the most climate smart, perfect institution on the face of the earth but we're working with developing countries who, even if you add up all of their emissions together, are not the source of a large part of the problem. We have to be able to speak to our shareholder countries and, and to, to the rich countries of the world about the knock-on effect of inaction on the fight against poverty, to which they have all subscribed. So our challenge is to go beyond our regular work with our clients and find ways to communicate and to work with this issue in, in populations which we don't have a relationship with directly. So we have to redouble efforts to reduce emissions, we have to drive investment in low carbon growth in order to agree, uh, avoid that four degree world. And if you ask yourself the question, what are the least number of most important things that need to be done? We've come up with four answers. 
You know, I challenge each of you to come up with a better answer. You know, we're not, we're not in the mood of playing death by a thousand paper cuts. What we're in the mood of is if you've got a better idea, give it to us and that will become the idea. But our four ideas are that we must catalyze globally a predictable and right price on carbon, that we need to remove harmful fossil fuel subsidies, which today um, are calculated at between a trillion and $1.4 trillion. Imagine what happens when you repurpose that money for different kind of forms of investment that work for both the environment and for the poor. That we need to build low carbon climate resilient cities. This is where the majority of the world's population will live, about 75% in 20 years time. That is where 80% of global emissions will come from as well. And we need to scale up climate smart agriculture. We need to change the way we farm. And while promoting aggressive mitigation efforts, we are going to have to be remain focused on adaptation, investing in the resilience of individuals, of communities, of cities and countries to the impact of changes which are being felt now. <coughs> but it's not just doom and gloom. I mean, I think doom and gloom is important, or rather fear is important in terms of getting an emotional reaction which may spur action. But we don't believe that the four degree world is unstoppable. We believe that the solutions are known, but there are political and communication and other challenges in their introduction. So if climate change is the threat, the opportunity is a cleaner and different and more inclusive growth path. It is possible to maximize efficiency, avoid decisions that lock in high carbon growth options, while at the same time reducing vulnerability to climate change for future generations. Making infrastructure climate resilient results in lower capital losses from natural disasters and creates jobs, despite the upfront <coughs> capital cost of making it climate resilient. So we calculate that there's a trillion dollar gap in infrastructure financing on a yearly basis at the moment that needs to be met this decade. So it's a trillion <coughs> a year. If you want to make that infrastructure climate resilient, then the cost goes up to about 1.3 to 1.4 trillion. That's not including operation and maintenance. So there is an upfront capital cost, but if we can mobilize that financing, then we, we, we build efficiency into the system for the long run. Abolishing harmful fossil fuel subsidies can reduce CO2 emissions, create much needed fiscal space for government, and allow, allow them to invest in better options for the poor and for climate. You know, some countries are carrying a two, three, four, five, six percentage points of GDP uh, penalty as a result of ineffective fossil fuel subsidies. And contrary to popular myth, well-designed environmental regulation does stimulate innovation in the private sector and improves business climate footprints, although most business owners will tell you that environmental regulation is killing them. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that well-designed environmental, regula environmental regulation has that impact. So more and more countries are really seeking ways to change their growth uh, towards a much more cleaner and more inclusive growth path. <laughs> Let's come to water, uh, International Water Day tomorrow. Uh, first of all, I think that um, I think Australia is probably there, but for many other countries, the political class, uh, government, um, the middle class, etc., aren't really aware that they are living in the middle of an urgent water crisis. Um, the water stress is uh, increasing around the globe. People living in deltas, uh, that's about 500 million people, and people living in monsoonal basins, which is about a billion people, are especially vulnerable. And for some countries, that starts to tally up quite remarkably. Uh, water is the primary medium through which climate change will impact people, economies, uh, and ecosystems. Uh, some people say that you can imagine climate change as a shark, uh, but the teeth is water. You know, you, you're gonna feel it first uh, through water. So better water management is really at the core of helping countries, especially the poorest, increase their resilience. And a lot of our work is really figuring out the pathway through the nexus of food security, water security, and energy security. You, you know, you need water for food, you need water for energy, you need energy for water, you need energy for food. Uh, and this is a highly complex challenge for, for most of the countries in which we work. And it means that they need to have analysis to complex hydrologies, which is one of the areas where Australia can really help the world the most because of your expertise and the investment you've made in that over the last 
30 to 40 and longer years. And importantly, we need to shift the management of forests and agriculture to landscape approaches, something that I'm pleased to say that a large part of the forest community and a large part of the agricultural community and the agricultural research community have now embraced. Um, a landscape approach means that we can integrate the management of land, water and living resources like forests while trying to find ways to promote equitable and sustainable use uh, and, and even conservation. I think it's possible. Over the past 10 years, we've been working in India, for example, on watershed management as an effective approach to improving natural resource productivity and rural livelihoods. You know, I've, I've spent time walking up and down the hillsides of Rwanda where we've been able to take an integrated approach. And what's important, I think, is that um, uh, we can do that uh, uh, and, and really see uh, really important results. So, for example, in Ethiopia, if you take an integrated community approach to natural forest regeneration, you restore um, groundwater and that then provides potable water to communities uh, for, for a very wide distance. So from water to food, the way in which we produce food has a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, climate smart agriculture, we call it climate smart agriculture, but really it's the way we farm, offers um, one of those rare chances in climate change policy um, of a triple win because it offers the opportunity to increase food productivity and nutrition outcomes uh, at the same time to increase, li increase livelihoods and support people with jobs who are working on the land and at the same time reduce emissions. In fact, pull emissions, uh, pull carbon out of the atmosphere uh, back in, into the soil. Uh, most other aspects of climate change policy are offering you a trade-off. Um, but in climate smart agriculture, there's actually a possibility of a win, win, win. So how many of you um, have ever heard of Fiderbia albida? No? Oh dear me, you've got to get out more. Okay, so this is a very imp important tree species in the Sahel. Right, so the Sahel, is, the Sahel has been experiencing droughts every five years, right? They're now going to be experiencing droughts every two years. So that we're going to have to come up with systemic change in order to cope with that. So in Niger, uh, trees of this species uh, are planted by local communities and the species drops its leaves, right, So that in the rainy season. So then those leaves start controlling erosion, they restore soil fertility, they increase sorghum and millet yields, and they put more money in the farmer's pocket. You know, it's such a simple solution. But taken to scale, it's part of what we call the green wall, uh, an attempt to hold the Sahel at bay, but really an attempt to uh, find a way for marginal communities to live successfully on what is already marginal land in a world where temperature rise is going to make that even more punishing. Now, the, the role of research and development in food is going to be absolutely essential. Now, Australia's got this very long proud tradition of agricultural research. I'm glad that the research community is now starting to take climate seriously in all aspects of its work. But research into crops that can be short cropped because the spaces between the rainy seasons are changing so violently, uh, crops that can be heat resistant, drought resistant, pest resistant, can have increased nutrient values, really offer real hope to the most marginal uh, rural communities. The trick is to get them into the hands of smallholder farmers. And if in sub-Saharan Africa we're going to lose 35% of cropland, this becomes absolutely urgent. Most of this research is actually done in the public domain. But for the private sector and its research, we have to find ways to solve intellectual property problems and get private sector research into the hands of farmers too. Now we have to talk about energy. Any solution to this becomes really a question of energy. The burning of fossil fuels for energy accounts for more than 80% of greenhouse gas emissions. So managing the energy transition in a country is a fundamental part of the solution. I think the way we look at it is that I think we need, I think most countries agree on the destination. Most countries agree that they want to move uh, their energy mix to one that is cleaner. If not because of global gas, global greenhouse gas emissions, then because of the, um, of the lack of co-benefits, you know, the impacts on human health, on children's health, of, uh, of uh, fossil fuel um, industry and energy. 
Uh, but if we can agree on the destination, which is that we all want to have a cleaner energy mix, not only because if there is a price on carbon, the intensity of carbon in your energy mix is going to cause economic hardships, um, then I think the other important thing to understand is that the journey that each country will go to is going to be fundamentally different. Depending on the natural resource endowment of the country, depending on access to technology, different decisions are going to be made. But 1.3 billion people today still don't have access to energy, and about 2.7 billion depend on solid wood, uh, sorry, solid fuels like wood, charcoal, dung, biomass, coal for cooking and heating. And so uh, we have a massive energy access problem at a time when we need to engineer these energy transitions. Now, lack of energy access is directly related to slow or non-existent economic growth. At the same time, kids cannot learn if they can't read their homework in the evening. Women uh, have to spend enormous amounts of time collecting firewood. Small businesses don't get set up and don't grow. And in terms of scale and materiality of the problem, even if we connected those 1.3 billion people to electricity today under the current energy mix of where the electricity grid is globally, we would only increase global greenhouse gas emissions by 1%. Precisely. That's called biomass where I come from. So let's... Re Let's, let's just remember where the emissions are coming from and where the energy transitions are really needed. Um, now, the idea that Cousinet's had that you need to grow dirty and then clean up uh, is disproven in our work on inclusive green growth. So there are creative destruction possibilities by helping poor countries move to a cleaner energy mix immediately. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the key for global greenhouse gas emissions in the energy sector is really very much in the developed world and in some of the large middle-income countries. So this is a key motivating factor between the United Nations Secretary General and President Jim Kim of the World Bank's Sustainable Energy for All initiative, where sort of the globe has agreed on um, energy access to all by 2030, doubling the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix by the same time, and doubling the rate of improvement in energy efficiency. And I think there's a galvanized, there's a galvanized um, set of actions now around energy that I haven't seen uh, for, for over a decade, including an alignment by the private sector in what the solutions uh, might be. So um, I think what's important in working through water, food and energy is that a lot of the solutions are there, but we're not moving at speed and scale. To get speed and scale, we have to leverage the private sector. Um, this means the use of public funds, public policy, um, in order to set the signals and set the incentives correctly for the private sector to do what it does best, which is innovate, uh, finance and move to scale. Um, the the, the uh, Stern report uh, published in 2008 uh, gave a price tag of $100 billion a year in order to meet uh, a two degree target. Um, the idea was always that 20 billion of that would come from public sources, 80 billion of that would come from the private sector. Um, despite the global financial crisis and despite the turn down in, in economic activity, um, the money is there. It's, it's sitting in long-term institutional investors in pension funds and wealth funds around the world. Uh, the question is unlocking that capital and having it invested in the things we need it to be invested in, in the places we need it to be invested in. And that, remains, that means using public money to buy down the risk and to find risk mitigants to that investment. The private sector is highly motivated as well by risk, right? If you're involved in a global supply chain, the fact that somewhere in your global supply chain water stress is going to take your business out, or the lack of access to productive land is going to challenge your business, this is concentrating the mind of, of private sector leaders. And in fact, that's why their calls for action and what the private sector will ask for more than anything else is a price on carbon because that will drive innovation R&D spending and it will drive investment in the right sectors of the economy and the evidence is that that's beginning to happen in countries that have priced carbon but they will also ask for regulatory predictability so in Europe as a result of austerity both Spain and Bulgaria have changed their renewable energy tariff regimes absolutely killed the renewable energy market so having that predictability becomes very important too 
but the losses are quite significant. I was just in Jakarta at the beginning of this week, and um, my team told me that in the latest floods in January, uh, where not only were there floods, but uh, one of the main levees broke, and uh, the center of Jakarta was under three foot, four foot of water uh, within seconds, including the presidential palace, that the losses to the car insurance industry uh, uh, were $500 million. Right? So that's an awful lot of, and believe you me, we saw the Maserati showroom in Jakarta. That was a lot of cars um, that were uh, damaged by that, um, by, that, by that flood. So if you start adding that up, the lot, uh, in Thailand, uh, in the recent floods, not, the year, not two years ago, the total uh, losses were calculated at 46 billion um, uh, uh, US dollars. 3% of the GDP of Thailand. So when you start adding this up, there's very real reasons why the private sector wants to see action. But what's interesting is that there's lots of innovation in the private sector. One of the examples which I like the best, because I worked on it, <laughs> is a, a port company, uh, a port operator uh, called Mueles de Rosque in uh, northern Colombia. A uh, private port management firm operating a concession on behalf of the Colombian government. And what they did in the study that we commissioned again with, with consultants for them was look at, um, look at the risk from climate change, so factoring in all of the modeling that we had, uh, and seeing that uh, sea level rise, the change in currents in the approach to the port, uh, as well as the change in uh, weather on land, which was producing more landslides and eroding, uh, on, uh, eroding landside infrastructure in the approach to the port that when you took all of that into account, the port needed to make investments now in order to stay at maximum productivity and maximum profitability. And this led them to making a $30 million capital investment in redredging uh, the approach and into some uh, land side infrastructure development. Um, and so again, they could see the, the alignment of their interests. The final example is oceans. Oceans, uh, the sea level rise affecting coastal, uh, coastal economic productivity, uh, acidification of the ocean affecting fish stocks, etc. So there's an enormous alignment of the seafood industry, the tourism industry, the shipping industry, any other business that is working in the coastal zone, either in the marine coastal zone or on land, in doing something to manage uh, our coastal resources better and blowing the whistle on what is happening to the oceans as a result of climate. So I was just doing a little video blog with Frank before, and he, he said, you know, what, what is the question that you, um, uh, or the comment or the, the call to action that you want to offer to ANU students? Um, well, we need your ideas, we, we need your creativity, we need your commitment. Um, as Jim Kim says, you know, can you answer the question of what did you do when you knew? But there are two areas where I think we really need to concentrate. We're doing a lot of work on communications, and Fiona Douglas, who works with me at the back, is, is leading this work. We know that the way we communicate this challenge isn't working at the moment. I mean, we're preaching to the converted, and that's working. But reaching beyond that to, to the majority is, is not working. And we know from, from, uh, from neuroscience, from psychiatry, from psychology, that there are ways to communicate that will produce more likelihood of action. Um, and we're starting to uh, work with people who are expert in this field to try to find the words that work. Most of the words I've used in this lecture don't work, right? Green does not work, um, because what's the opposite of green? Exactly. Um, so you can't get people to react to the word. And also green, for the men in the audience, I'm afraid, is not a masculine word, so you just cross your legs as soon as I say <laughs> green and I've lost you. Um, now, um, Penny Wong used to talk about clean. Right? What's the opposite of clean? Yeah. Dirty, exactly. Who wants to be dirty, right? So, I mean, there are real, re and uh, I think it's, it's not just Penny, but uh, also Lisa Jackson, who um, got a bad rap in the United States, but was one of the most effective secretaries of the Environmental Protection Agency that I think the US has seen in recent years. You never heard her talk about climate change. She talked about clean air for children's health, and that was the lens through which she got public action going forward. So I think that there is uh, a huge piece of work around how we communicate the threat, but how we communicate what the world will look like if we take the opportunity of shifting the patterns that we're building into the system today. It's very difficult to get people to give something up unless you can paint a picture of what that world will look like 
when we make the difficult decisions today and no, don't put them off. And then the second thing that you all need to be working on is the political authorizing environment. You know, this is not something that is for 20 years down the road. This is something for today. It's material. When my boss goes to the G20, and when Christine Lagarde goes to the G20, and they are asked about the long-term, the threats to long-term growth, their answer increasingly is climate change. And so that's something we have to translate in the political dialogue that we have in each of the countries in which we live. So, Drew Weston, the psychiatrist who wrote a book called The Political Brain, uh, who is much of the inspiration for the work that we're going to be doing on communications, stood in front of my network at the World Bank just a few weeks ago and said the two hardest audiences when it comes to communicating the challenge of climate change differently are engineers and environmentalists. <laughs> so for all the environmentalists in the room and for all the engineers in the room, uh, we just got to get out of the way in the way we communicate this and we're just going to have to find a way to talk to people who are scared, rightfully so, who can't see what a future might look like that would be different if they have to give something up, show them how much they would get from a cleaner world. Um, and that's something that we really have to be a, a coalition of the working on. Thank you very much. <laughs>